Thank you so much to Sir Roger and to, to Yang and, and Thomas for, for their fantastic questions. Um, there's been a load of brilliant questions online. So people in the theatre, the pressure's on because there's some good people online. So uh, I'll just ask one question online while uh, the stewards go and find people to uh, ask questions. Um, one of the questions was, um, you said that a computer wouldn't be conscious, but now we're developing qubits and quantum computers. Do you think now that sort of quantum magic that you need to get consciousness could therefore be contained in a, in a quantum computer? No. You see, I mean, that's my argument. I mean, you see, I could be wrong on all these things. But what I was trying to say is people say, okay, well, you know, to have actually quantum mechanics going on in the brain, well, there's a lot of quantum mechanics. In fact, the whole of chemistry is quantum mechanics. Well, there's, oh, no, 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 I don't mean chemistry, yes. No, other kinds of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's lots of quantum mechanics going on, but this is not quantum mechanics. This is beyond quantum mechanics. You see, it's quantum state reduction, which as currently is just an ad hoc way of, of making what you call making a measurement. At some point, you don't follow the Schrodinger equation. You wheel out of the cupboard the other thing which makes a measurement, and you wheel it back again, and then you go on with the Schrodinger equation. But the thing is that you wheeled out of the cupboard is making a measurement. Now, what does that mean? Well, lots of people thought it was because a conscious being sees it. I don't think that. It's the other way around. It's the measurement making is something in the physical world which goes beyond quantum mechanics, as we currently believe quantum mechanics. Now, you see, the question goes on. It's the same question. You say, why couldn't you incorporate that into a, into a device and therefore make it conscious? And I'm saying, maybe you could. I'm not arguing against that. I don't like the idea very much, but that's not the point. <laughs> I think maybe you could, yes. I have no argument against it. I think we're a long way, long way away from it. I'm, there are a lot of, there's some people working on this sort of thing, and they're really nice, interesting results, you know, with microtubules and how much can they do in the way of preserving quantum coherence. You need to preserve it at a really deep level which may involve quite a lot of the brain all at once, I wouldn't be surprised. And then the conscious moment, perception of consciousness, according to this idea, occurs when the Schrodinger equation is not followed and one thing or the other thing or the other thing happens. It's the way we do quantum mechanics, but it's not following the equations of quantum mechanics. You have to get that... See, people think quantum mechanics is, is marvelous and mysterious and nobody understands it. Sure, all those things are true, but that's <laughs> not the point. The point is that it doesn't follow... I'm just giving you my view because you probably find other people who say, oh, yeah, it still does follow the Schrodinger equation, but then you're led into this viewpoint, which is called many worlds. You have to have all these different alternatives coexisting, and this is a picture that people have mainly in Oxford, I may say it's quite a, a <laughs> hotbed of this idea, that these different alternatives coexist. I don't believe that. I think it's a good thing in your life, if you're a physicist, to have gone through a phase where you've believed that for a certain period of time, <laughs> and, and then rejected it. So I'm happy to say I did go, th go through a phase at one stage. <laughs> yes. So we've got a question uh, just up there. Uh, so... My question is about a particular feature of your writing. Your books are, are like phenomenally clear. <laughs> yes, and sir. one of the unique features that you add to your books is you usually start them with a small story. So in, oh, in yeah. Shadows of the Mind, you start with a story of a little girl and her father in a cave. Yes. And in, um, well, in one of your other books, you start with Amtep, the, uh, the sculptor, kind of waking up. And yes. the question is, why do you start with these stories and what are you trying to create or accomplish? It them. was quite curious. You see, the first one came about, that was the little boy sitting in the audience and, and they're just about to turn on this great computer, this wonderful machine, which will be able to answer questions. And, and it was based partly on the emperor's new clothes, the idea that this little boy could see that, that uh, there was no awareness in this machine, basically. But this... Partly, I've given the name to the book, the Emperor's, New the Emperor's New Mind, you see. And I found that lots of people didn't understand what the point was. So I realized I needed this little story to explain the connection with the story, the Emperor's New Clothes. 
So that's why I put the little story in the beginning. I did find that lots of people still didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, still, but that was why that little story happened in the first one. Then I thought, well, I'll do it again for the next book, which was Shadows, wasn't it? And then I thought of the Plato's Cave. That was really mm. based on the, on the Plato's Cave. And you have the, uh, the shadows. And so it was, that was the idea there. And then the, the next one, it got a bit out of hand because the one on the road right. to reality... Uh, got very long, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but then for, you see, I didn't do it. For, for uh, fa fashion, faith or fantasy, I didn't put a little story in. I thought they were getting a bit out of hand, so I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to your question. Is, I don't know if that is clear, near enough to an answer. It would have to do, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm painfully aware that there's been a lot of men speaking, so uh, particularly quite welcome questions from women. Um, but uh, there was also um, another question uh, online, um, which is maybe a little bit more of a flippant question, which is that if Jeff Bezos were to say to you, you do, do you want to be the first Nobel Prize winner slash OM awardee in space, would you say yes? <laughs> so what was again? If Jeff Bezos wanted to send you into space, oh, to space. would, you, would you say yes? <laughs> I don't think I would, no. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure I'd trust it that much. They, they, they did come down all right. But, uh, no, I can see it would be fun, but I, I think uh, I don't need it. Any questions from the centre block at all? Anyone, anyone waving? I think it was a waste of resources, too. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on um, Yang's idea of beauty. Um, do you find that we've lost a sense that we should do things so that they could be beautiful and we're driven more by the um, compulsion to make them useful? I'm afraid my hearing is not good. Could somebody... So the question was about um, beauty and, and are we driven to create music and... Uh... Oh, beauty. Oh. And, and, sort of, and I guess more of the place of beauty in maths and... and yes, science. well, of course, that's a subtle question. And also the question of writing music with computers and things like that. See, there, of course, you see, you don't have a goal. It's not like with, with, with Go and things like that. You know who wins. But these are things where it's... I mean, you, you could have a lot of people trying to judge which was more beautiful. But then they'd have to listen to these things endlessly, and I wouldn't trust their judgment after a long while. <laughs> so so it's, you can't really do it the same way. I don't know whether there's a way of doing that. Whether you could use beauty in a way and use people's judgment of beauty... But I think, the, I'm not sure that was the question. The question is how much of value is it in judging things in, was that the question? In, in, as a driving force in trying to understand science. Um, the question was whether we, uh, we've lost the sense that the beautiful should be something that we can use to make Well, you see, it's, it's very important but you mustn't get carried away by it. I don't quite know how to phrase this. You see, there are people who work... I have to be a little bit careful what I say. <laughs> people who work on theoretical physics and they produce incredible mathematical schemes, which certainly have beauty to them. There's no question about it. The beauty really lies in the mathematics and what you can achieve using certain techniques which have a beauty of their own. But I don't think that's good enough if you're trying to do physics. I do believe it's true that if you get the physics right, it has a beauty. Now, I don't quite know why that should be true. It's usually because it brings things together in a way which you hadn't seen before, and they fit. And there is something beautiful about that kind of idea. But just to be guided by the beauty is a dangerous thing. And I think... I certainly don't want to dog give a dogmatic answer to that one way or the other. Because I think certainly many of the great physicists and other kinds of scientists have, particularly Dirac has made this comment about, I think there was a quote from Dirac, which something like, how did you make your great discoveries? And he said, well, I, 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 I'd hate to 
think of this as a direct quote because it probably isn't. But it was something like saying, I have a very keen sense of the beauty and when I had these ideas, I knew I was right. <laughs> I don't think it could be quite as extreme as that and I would be nervous about that kind of statement. I've certainly thought things were beautiful and they turned out to be wrong. That <laughs> certainly happened. <laughs> On the other hand, I certainly do also believe that if you get nature right, there is a deep beauty to it, of, of, which you may not even appreciate at first. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have no, no doubt about that. But whether that is somehow, because it brings together so many things, and you've been worrying about how these things could possibly be brought together and they don't seem to fit, and then you see, oh, they do fit in that unexpected way. And there's something remarkably beautiful about that. I don't think I can make a a clear statement about it. I certainly do think that beauty is a, is a guide, and it's a good guide to an extent, but you mustn't get carried away by it. Hmm. And uh, I think we've just got a question over here. Uh, there's two over here, one here and a uh, lady over here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sir Roger, for a very entertaining um, and interesting uh, conversation. I'd like to bring, ask the subject of your cyclical universes theory, and you pose some of the problems in your book, um, some of the challenges that you may receive uh, because of that theory. And one of them is the remaining mass in the universe, that is electrons that won't go away. And, and you posit that it may be okay because they can't make clocks and that uh, perhaps that would uh, be sufficient, but you didn't like the idea of having to accept that. Do you have any new thoughts on that area now that, uh, you know, since the book has been written? Unfortunately, I did catch all the, the yeah, central the, part of the question. The remaining mass in, in CCC, the remaining mass that remains in the universe, the electrons, you, you, you posit away, um, you, you see that as being a challenge to your theory. Have you thought more into how, um, whether some remaining mass is still a, a problem that can be got over? I think there could well be some mathematics. You're thinking about mathematics which... You see, for example, I don't know if... The, let me answer a question that you might be answering. If it's a different one, tell me, asking, <laughs> tell me if it's the wrong question. But you see, Einstein, in his theory of general relativity, I mean, it's a fantastic theory, and it brings together ideas that, in quite a different way. You see, Einstein, Newton has this one theory of gravity. Why do you want to change that theory? And so on. OK, you've got to make it consistent with special relativity. That's a bit of a challenge. But it's a completely different way of looking at gravity. Now, Einstein could have had that way already. It was uh, partly already known to Galileo. You see, you drop, drop a big rock and a little rock from the leaning, leaning tower, and whether he did it himself or not. And he knew, well, he knew air resistance would make them not be quite the same, but if there was no air resistance, they would drop together. OK, make that into a theory. That's what Einstein was able to do. Somehow, gravity had this very curious property that if you fall freely with it, it goes away. It's not true of any other force. It's a striking fact. The fact that Newton builds up this great scheme of forces and which could go into all these other forces. And then Einstein comes away and takes the rug from under it, in a sense, by saying that one thing you started with, gravity, isn't really a force in the same sense because you fall freely with it and it goes away. This led him to his theory of general relativity. Now, he'd have been completely stuck if it hadn't been, I don't know, half a century earlier, Riemann had formulated a general theory of curved spaces. That theory had been worked on by the, a lot of Italian mathematicians and people. An amazing theory, but it hadn't been thought of as being really the answer to how gravity works, anything like that. But that theory was sitting there waiting to be used by Einstein. Now, that piece of mathematics could have been unknown. So I, I don't know if that's what you were saying. It needed mathematics that was not being used in physics up to that point. Now, it could well be that the physics of now needs mathematics. There's no Riemann who'd been sitting there working out the mathematics. Mm. And you've got to do it yourself, or somebody's got to do it. That's quite possible. I, 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 but see, mathematics is spread out to so, so much further than it used to be that it's more than likely whatever you need will be hiding somewhere in that. But 
that's not much help because there's so much mathematics around. Mm -hmm. To say that it's got to be somewhere in that great body of mathematics is almost mm -hmm. as bad as saying it's unknown. <laughs> you have to have the insight to know exactly which kind of mm -hmm. mathematics you want. Mm -hmm. And that could be really tricky. But it is possible that it is mathematics that is yet unknown. I don't know if that was your question. Mm -hmm. That's my formulation of your question. I know we're slightly over time, but I think we can just got squeeze in one more question, I think. Yeah, one more. Professor Penrose, um, many, many amazing scientists have spoken in this extraordinary theatre over the last 222 years, and we are incredibly lucky that, that you are one of them. And my question to you was, if you could choose somebody from that time to appear now in the theatre to have a conversation with, who would be your choice and why? So, which time are you talking about? Mr. Any time? time in the last 222 Any time from years. Ooh, 1799 <laughs> onwards. Ooh, there's a challenge. <laughs> that's a difficult one. You see, am I expecting to learn something that's not known in current science? Or it's really more that... I don't know, I have to go back to Galileo, probably. Is that good enough? He was all my, always my real hero. Of all of them, I think. I'm not sure we ever had Galileo here, but we can <laughs> pretend we did. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry to, if, I, if I gave the wrong answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a fantastic way to end. And uh, I just want to say a few words to um, say a massive thank you to, to the London Institute for Mathematical Sciences for putting this event together. And uh, thank you so much to Yang. Thank you so much to, to Thomas. And of course, uh, thank you to all for coming, but especially thank you to Sir Roger and wish you all good night. Thank you so much.